Tonight's show has been brought to you by FMC Preschool, Canola School, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver. Leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Well, hello, everyone, and good evening. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Welcome to The Agronomists, to our 100th episode, if you can believe it. Um, so I just imagine that there are, like, fireworks and stuff going off. Anyway, uh, <laughs> hi to Ray and to Kevin joining us, Lilith and Jason as well. And, of course, I know Paisley's watching, so hello, Paisley. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about flea beetles, and I am so looking forward to this conversation. Uh, but before we get to that, quick reminders, of course, you can uh, qualify for CEU credits for joining us tonight. So please head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists tomorrow morning. Let us know you watch the show and get those CEU credits. Um, I do want to also mention that uh, if you are on that page and are going to fill in your CU credits, you can actually opt in to get an email that will remind you about the show happening every Monday, what the topic is, and will even zip you an email the next day if you missed it. So there you go. All right. Yes, Ray, 100 Mondays. Uh, that's how long the show has been on. Um, Yay! So there you go. Yay! Jay, thank you. Producer Jay did have a sound effect ready. Okay. All right. We got there. Okay. Perfect. And now we shall bring in my guests now that we've completely lost all our composure. All right. So tonight to talk about flea beetle management, I've got Dr. Boyd Murray with the University of Alberta and Dr. John Kowalski with Manitoba Agriculture. Welcome here, gentlemen. How are you? Very good. All right. I already um tried to identify the insects on john's shirt um i didn't even get close so if anybody else wants to take a crack at it please do and john you'll have to let us know if we're if we're anywhere near okay i only really got one of them uh okay so but boyd i'll start with you before we dig really into this uh what is keeping you busy in the research world over at the u of a oh too much no <laughs> insects are always on the mind right um uh... Lately, actually, it's been alfalfa weevil um, down in southern Alberta dealing with insecticide resistance. Um, flea beetles, great topic tonight because we have a few projects on those that hopefully we'll update you on, um, as well as looking at some midges. So we're all about the midges in the lab these days. Wheat midge, canola flower midge, swede midge, um, different experiments all going on uh, at the moment. So lots of fun. Mm hmm. I like midges. I mean, it sounds cute, but they're not terribly cute. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, John, uh, this is, of course, we are full on into conference season. So I would imagine you've got already a few under your belt and lots ahead. What are farmers asking about most right now? Well, uh, flea beetles, which we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, grasshoppers seems to be another hot topic mm -hmm. this winter. Um, and a little bit about aphids. They're another one that we uh, had some issues with this year. So uh, at the meetings, those are usually the top three that uh, I get questions on. A little bit of cutworms and ligus bug and a few mm -hmm. other insects. But uh, yeah, uh, flea beetles, grasshoppers, aphids, those seem to be the top three for now. Mm -hmm. It's going to rain this year, John, so grasshoppers aren't going to be a problem. Uh, so it's fine. <laughs> I've already it decided rains. that. Right. Okay. Well, okay. It, 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 we got a lot of rain last year in yes. uh, in in May, and uh, we also yeah. got grasshoppers. But that's a whole different topic. So yeah. we'll do that one another I tried. night. I tried. Okay. Um, hi, Janet. Thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, let's dig in. So we have a few, well, more than a few issues with flea beetles. But before we can start to address how we're managing these pests, let's first start with the life cycle because we we of course have to understand the beast before we can try and tame it so uh producer jay i think we've got uh, i think it's slide five of john's i'm not sure that's got the life cycle on there and uh john if you want to maybe walk us through this when why does it matter that they overwinter as adults is maybe my first question as we go through this well, because uh, you will see them very early, 
because they're overwintering as an adult rate of feed. So with flea beetles, uh, I'm, I'm going to backtrack maybe here a little bit. Um, because we use the term flea beetle, uh, we've actually got over 70 species of flea beetles in the prairies. So there's okay. lots of different types. And there's even, believe it or not, there's even good flea beetles. There's, no. yes, there are ones that feed on nothing but weeds. There's been, in, uh, there's, there's a few species that feed on nothing but leafy spurge. Now in canola, we've got roughly, you, you can find up to about 10 species but there's two that are usually very dominant. That's the two mentioned on this slide here, crucifer and striped. So when we talk about the life cycle, that's for these two species. And both of them overwinter as adults. So you see them twice. You will see them late summer, and then you see them in the spring. And that's because they're overwintering as an adult. And uh, usually it's, depending on the species, it can be mid to late April some years with the striped flea beetle. Um, other, if it's a, a, a cooler spring, it might be even into May when you start noticing them. Striped comes out a little bit earlier than the crucifer. So they do have slightly different emergence times, but the rest of their cycle is at least similar enough that we can generalize. So okay. uh, those adults that come out in the spring, they're laying eggs, uh, it takes about roughly about 12 days for the eggs to hatch. And then they go through a larval stage in the soil, feeding on um, the, the, mainly the root hairs of the canola. And they go through three different stages as a larva. It takes about anywhere from about 25 to 34 days to get through that stage. And then they go through a pupa or a resting stage for another uh, usually seven to nine days. And then the adults come out again in late summer. So, I mean, because their emergence is really spread out, um, that second batch usually starts coming out late July and throughout August. So one complete cycle in a year, but the adults are there twice. Right. Now, um, Ray asked the question, Ray, I think this is a bit scary because you're reading my mind. Um, and I'll ask it of Boyd. Oh, look at this. Here we go again. Oh, we, okay. I like this. This is very pretty. So now we're covering how everybody learns. Do you like graphs? We have graphs. Do you like visuals? We have visuals. Um, yes. But as John, as you've pointed out, there are essentially two species we are most worried about. But does that matter? Boyd, I'll, I'll throw it to you to go to go through this. And I ask that question. Does it matter the difference between striped and crucifer? Ooh, good question. Um, I think John would also maybe confirm this, but historically we used to consider stripes kind of a more northern pest and crucifer down in southern regions. Um, but lately we've seen a shift in the species composition. So we find striped quite widespread. Um, as John mentioned, striped do tend to be out earlier in the spring. Uh, they can handle the colder weather a little bit better than the crucifer. Um, and unfortunately, some previous work has shown that the striped flea beetles are more tolerant of our neonicotinoid C treatments. Um, so there's reduced mortality, or pardon me, they're more, yeah, they are less susceptible um, to okay. the C treatments. Um, that's probably one of the, one of the big things for us um, at the moment. Um, so yes. other than that, yeah, it's... It, we treat it as a complex, so we're we're never going to at the moment we're never going to just try and target one species or the other. Um, it is definitely a complex, uh, and we just in this case between the two flea beetles, a flea beetle is a flea beetle. Okay. Now, is there a difference? And we we can talk. I want to talk prevention and management, but we have to talk control as well. And yes, we are going to talk about control options um, and how that has changed for this year, but for foliar options do we see a difference between striped and crucifer uh so far uh, no um okay. some some ongoing work in our lab actually just this past summer uh at least in alberta we looked at several different populations across alberta and they were still in well in terms of the synthetic pyrethroids they were still all susceptible to the synthetic pyrethroids um so that would be your yeah your matador your desis 
um, mm -hmm. silencer, et cetera. So, yeah. Now, of course, two of those are the same active, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but okay, so this graphic, though, this, I did not know about the root hair feeding. So this is cool, because I love it when I learn stuff too. Does that ever have an impact in that we have seen incredibly high levels of flea beetles in some canola fields? So if they're all laying eggs, and all those eggs are feeding, do we ever see an economic impact to that late season feeding? I'll ask that to both of you, because it'd be interesting to see if either of you have heard. Well, there's there has been a study on this in Manitoba. Uh, it's an older study. Um, and they were artificially putting uh, quite high levels of uh, flea beetle larva in the soil and had them feeding on the roots. They were able to get up to about a 5% yield loss with extremely high levels. So now keep in mind, this is the root hairs they're feeding on mainly. It's not, uh, they're, they're not tunneling into the tap roots like a root maggot is. It's more the, mm -hmm. the root hairs. Uh, you, would, you would need extremely heavy levels to really have uh, something that's uh, uh, very measurable. So again, it, it can be up to maybe 5%, which, you know, uh, I guess could be somewhat significant, but again, that was a study where uh, they were artificially uh, creating some very high levels on the roots. Right. Okay. Now, all right. So Boyd, good question here on the differences in species. So Jason Vote out of Manitoba asks, are there differences in species based on landscape and what overwintering locations they prefer? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. That's a that's a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, John might know better than me. Um, I think there was some previous work done here at the U of A by Lloyd Dosdell and um, one of his former students, Brian Ulmer, um, looking at overwintering uh, sites. And but I believe it was just on Crucifer, um, mm -hmm. and they found it. They mainly overwintered out of the fields, kind of in hedgerows, along ditches, um, in kind of the you know, yards around the fields, but not as much in the field. Um, I think it's the same for striped. Maybe John can uh, can add his two cents. <laughs> what do you yeah, think, John? You know, well, what's really interesting is when you go and look at what's present in the late summer on the canola plants, uh, try this sometime. Try to find a striped flea beetle in that population. Uh, oh. Often it is primarily crucifer. Uh, we we really don't know a lot about what stripe does late in the season. Uh, as Boyd mentioned, a lot of the work on the overwintering has been with crucifer flea beetle. Now, mm -hmm. we've, we've put out emergence traps in the bush and stuff in the past, and you do get both in your traps. But I, I think there's a lot that's really not known about what the striped flea beetle is doing late in the season. Um, why aren't we seeing more of those on the plants? Mm -hmm. And where are they going? What are they doing? Uh, I think there's a lot of unknowns for striped flea beetle. The secret life of striped flea beetles. Yes. They're, they're, they're like, project. yeah, they're like moonlighting somewhere. I don't know. They're off doing something else. Who knows? All right. Devin's got a good question. And Boyd, I think you hit on this a little bit. Maybe you missed it. Or maybe we need to dig in a little bit more. But we do. And maybe I'll set this up as well. There's definitely been some conversations about, you know, our flea beetles becoming resistant or somehow more tolerant of neonic seed treatments? Um, or are we just seeing such high levels that they're just overcoming the plant? There are so many questions on the management side. So I do want to dig into some of this. But so Devin wants to know, um, do the seed treatments, uh, so are striped beetles, I guess, not being killed by some of these um, versus the crucifer? Yeah, so previous work, uh... Again, here, well, actually here at the U of A, as well as Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon, um, with some of the neonicotinoids, they found that the striped were more tolerant. So some of them would survive when feeding on treated seedlings. Um, mm -hmm. That wasn't the case uh, for Crucifer. Um, in terms of where we're at now, so that study, the last study was about 2008, I believe, um, 2008, 2009. And... So since then, um, there hasn't been much work. 
Uh, we're following up on it actually right now uh, in our lab. And I think uh, there's some groups in Saskatchewan as well. Um, but it, it does. So yes, striped flea beetles do. Um, some of them do survive feeding on treated seedlings. Um, mm-hmm. And, but we also are seeing extremely high population densities in some of our fields. Um, so I think mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of a, unfortunately you get two, you're getting hit twice. So a little bit of mm-hmm. survival plus just high populations. Mm-hmm. Now, John, if I remember correctly, that work suggested that it wasn't that we had selected these flea beetles for this. This was like an in- natural just tolerance or weren't killed as easily by neonics. Is that accurate? That is fair. Yes. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind for something to become resistance, it means there there has to have been a genetic change in the insects mm-hmm. so that they can now um, tolerate or feed on the, the mm-hmm. plants without getting killed. Whereas your, uh, your susceptible population would. So there's actually been a, a, a genetic change for something to be resistance. Uh, in this case, we, there's no evidence of there being any genetic change in the population. They're just, uh, and again, there's there's lots of different species of flea beetles, and they're not all going to be killed to the same mm-hmm. extent by a given product. There's going to be a little bit of variability. And uh, in this case, uh, the striped, uh, there's a, a little bit better survival than with the, the crucifer. Mm-hmm. You, you never get 100%. Uh, you're, right. you, usually there's a little bit of survival, or very rarely anyway, often there's a little bit of survival. And that's what we have to be concerned over. And that's why we tell people to rotate your chemistries too, because you always do have that little fraction that will survive and um, right. you don't want them to become your dominant uh, population. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I do want to throw to, as we get into some of the management discussions, uh, but Janet's got a quick question here that I think is, I've never thought about it. What attracts the flea beetles to the plant? Is it sugar or protein? I want to say the dashing good looks of the cotyledons, but I don't think that's true. So what what do the flea beetles love particularly about canola? Neither of what you mentioned are oh. in the recipe. There's actually two different things. And uh, one is uh, it's a chemical. So the, the uh, family of plants that canola belongs to, uh, Brassicaceae, the Cruciferae family, they have a group of chemicals called glucosinolates in them the and there's lots of different yes. so yeah well, like we, uh, um, and there's many different types of these glucosinolates but there's one in particular is called and and don't try to uh, repeat this but allyl isothiocyanate big long chemical name that's what yeah. i was gonna say yeah and and, and th- this chemical it, it's it, it it smells like horseradish if when you get it in the mm. concentrated form delicious and, and flea beetles are drawn to this particular glucosinolate. They really like it. Now, in, in nature, um, when plants are damaged, uh, they release a little bit of this chemical. And if the plants are spread out, you get this uh, little bit of a chemical um, movement and flea beetles nearby would find the plants. Now, when you have a canola field and it's being fed on, uh, that large volume of canola is releasing a lot of this chemical. So flea beetles from a long ways away are picking up on this and they're being drawn to that field. And there's a second thing going on here. When they're in the field, the males release what we call an aggregation pheromone, which is attractive to both males and females. And there's a um, synergistic relationship between the pheromone and this allyl isothiocyanate. So either chemical alone is going to be somewhat attractive. You put the two together and they're really highly attractive. So you've this got two is fascinating, John. And also horrible because that would explain why we get inundated by flea beetles. By one day, you know, you notice some and by the next it's like, oh, we have a problem. Yes. Like so that totally makes sense. Also hats off to you for n- not just saying it once, John. 
but twice. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, Ray says the canola is screaming. Yes, it's screaming with its spicy horseradish breath. That's what it's doing. That's okay. So that's amazing, and I will never forget this moment. Okay. Um, Producer Jay, I want to run the clip, actually, clip two, which is with Jack Payne, because I want to move into the conversation about some of the management things. So should we be seating late or early? High seating rates, low seating rates, wide rows, narrow rows. Let's get into some of that. So Jack's going to set up some of this. He speaks uh, in this video, this Canola School episode, directly about planting depth. So Jay, if we can go to the clip. Now, if you've got flea beetles, what's going to happen is maybe there's two or three plants per square foot comes up out of that deep uh, depth. Now those flea beetles are going to say, hey, canola, and they jump on those few plants. And so now those few plants get an awful lot of feeding damage on them. And then uh, we get a rain or something a little bit later, and then the other canola that's at half an inch or three quarters of an inch germinates and comes later. And so you've got uneven emergence. Um, the other thing can happen is if you're in an area that's got relatively moist soils and you've got half an inch to two inches deep, the inverse happens. The stuff that's at, the seed that's at a half an inch emerges first because it's shallow. Again, it's only part of the stand. The flea beetles go, oh, wow, canola. They jump on those few plants. And then the other plants that are struggling from two inches down break the surface maybe a few days later. And now you've got uneven emergence. But again, the flea beetles have fed early, really hard on the early emerged canola. So that's the other thing that comes into when we're talking about flea beetle damage. One thing we've got to look at is if you seed it early, be prepared that you may have to look after flea beetles because flea beetles overwinter as adults. The first canola out of the ground is going to be the target. They're hungry. They're hungry, that's what they're going to go after. Okay, So that's, that's one factor. The other factor you need to look at too is actually taking a step backwards. Last fall, I had quite a few calls coming in from agronomists saying farmers were encountering high populations of flea beetles in the fall on crops that were maturing. Well, it's too late to control them. I would mark those fields from last year and say, okay, keep an eye on that area because if there were a lot of flea beetles in that area last year, they've probably overwintered. Any canola that's been seeded close to that area is probably ripe for the picking for the flea beetles. So there's the high risk there. The, um, the other aspect to look at is your seeding rate. The old seed rate guidelines were seven plants to 12 plants per square foot. Now we've dialed that back now to about five to seven plants per square foot, five to eight plants per square foot. I know Scott Mears, um, I, I learned some very valuable lessons from him. He said, if you're targeting on the low end of the plant population spectrum, he said, it's all a numbers game. Fewer plants mean the potential for more flea beetles per plant. So if you're, if you're seeding on the low end of that spectrum of target, um, you may have to you know, be on, on, on the lookout to scout for flea beetles and, and, and monitor to see what's, what's going on. Our sponsors for this episode of The Agronomists are Adama Canada, Canola School and FMC Preschool. Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you the tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. All right, so Jack kind of alluded to one of the perhaps somewhat controversial questions. Um, and we've Michael has asked it in the chat, so we'll sort of start there. Do fall numbers correlate to spring pressure? So if you're out in the field scouting um, or it's late in the season and you're noticing just the carpet of them, because I've seen it, does that correlate? Who wants to take that one first? Can you say I'll it in say, one voice? Okay, John, <laughs> you start. <laughs> I'll say sometimes, but okay. there's always a but. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, there was some research on this by AAFC, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Winnipeg. Uh, now this is decades ago. 
and they were trying to correlate fall and spring numbers. And it was a very, very poor correlation. Uh, I don't even know if they published the data. It was very poor, the correlation. Um, it, sometimes it, it does match up, but there are times that it doesn't. So it's not a guaranteed thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it is a good um, uh, a good precaution, uh, as, as he mentioned. Um, certainly, if you've got big populations, flag them. There could be high populations there in the spring. It's not a guarantee, but yeah, certainly higher risk. Mm -hmm. And Ray is correct. Entomologists say sometimes soil soil folks say it depends. Agronomists also use it depends quite a bit. That's one of our favorites here on the show. All right, Boyd, what, what do you think might be a factor there? In, so why aren't, if we know this insect overwinters, why can't we find this correlation between high fall numbers and spring pressure? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of mortality that we don't know about and we haven't accounted for. Um, you know, the it depends or sometimes really, you know, we think about snow cover, we think about how cold it's been when we have these, um, you know, uh, Arctic air movements and all of this. And when we have these minus 40s for days on end, we always wonder what it's going to be doing for our for our insects that are overwintering. Um, it's found, I think, if there's about a foot of snow on the ground, the it actually insulates the ground. And so the ground temperature usually stays around minus 10 or so, um, which mm -hmm. a lot of insects can still survive. Um, and so I think that's a that's quite a big factor. We still don't know all of these mortality uh, factors or what, you know, what is the ultimate point that will kill these flea beetles off. Um, and, as we, you know, we don't even know where the striped flea beetle is going. So uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to say when you don't know where it is, what it's being exposed to I over, just, over and the winter time. I imagine we need like tiny homing devices and we need to just outfit <laughs> some of them with homing devices and send them out into the world. This is why I don't do research, you guys, because these are the things that I would be like, okay, I've got a great idea. This is what we're going to do. Okay, so... Great question. So Scott, Scott is heading down the rabbit hole that I sort of want to get onto in that we do have some good research. But we also, John, I think as I was looking through some of the slides you prepared for tonight's presentation, we have some conflicting research as well. Um, so I think this is where maybe this sometimes or it depends comes up. So Scott's question is about tillage. So let's maybe start there. What do we know about tillage and flea beetles. So if canola is grown under a zero till system, does that increase or decrease potential of flea beetle problems? Uh, generally it decreases. And there's been okay. research in Alberta to to show that. And uh, as well as Sweden, there's been uh, quite a bit of research recently in Sweden too, where they're looking at tillage regime, reg regimes and uh, flea beetles. Um, but yeah, the Alberta research uh, showed pretty clearly that there was less flea beetle, less flea beetles, and less flea beetle damage in no-till versus conventional till. And what they figure is probably happening: um, flea beetles, like all insects, have preferred um, environments that they like to feed under. And with the zero till, you have a cooler, damper microclimate. Uh, at soil level, which uh, flea beetles seem to like more the open, sunny, dry environment. Um, so yeah, just, just having that ground cover seems to deter them. Now I should um, maybe follow that up by saying, uh, don't assume that means no damage. It means less damage. Uh, you still have it, it, zero till or not, you still have to keep an eye on things because there are situations where zero till you still may end up full year spraying. Uh, it may reduce your risk somewhat, but it's not a standalone control. Mm -hmm. So now we also heard, so Jack referenced um, seeding depth as, as one of the factors. In my mind, I sort of think about any time we can get a crop to emerge evenly, we sort of solve a lot of issues or at least decrease our risk of things. Um, 
but in thinking through uneven emergence, so that's maybe depth, um, you know, maybe it's seating conditions, those sorts of things. Walk me, Boyd, walk me through a little bit of sort of how that feeding pattern happens with the flea beetles of why we would worry about, you know, perhaps uneven or, or not great establishment conditions. Yeah, so to follow up on John, even on the tillage. So if you're doing early season tillage, you also are removing some of those uh, early season hosts for flea beetles. So if you have some cruci mm -hmm. cruciferous weeds in your fields, they'll be hanging out on there until your canola pops up. Once your canola starts to emerge, they'll switch and they'll jump onto the seedlings. And if you have just spotty emergence, they're gonna, there's gonna, it's a numbers game, right? There's gonna be more flea beetles on fewer plants. And then even once they chewed those ones down, if the populations are high enough, and then you have more emergence in other parts of your field, they can easily move. Um, if you've ever seen them on in the field, which I'm sure all of you have, you know they can jump, but they can also fly very well too. Um, so they can move significant distances. Um, and so when you even, you know, if you're just moving to the next row, to the next plant, that's easy enough, but they can easily move between, you know, large sections of fields between, between fields. Um, so it's really, you know, they're looking for that, for that, they're smelling that plant and they're looking for that plant to come and feed on, get some mm -hmm. lunch, breakfast and dinner. I just, canola's bad breath is all I can think about. Okay. So more plants. So increased seeding rates then potentially can help. Um, yes. Okay. But this is, I think, a bone of contention in the canola industry as well, or for canola growers, canola seed is expensive. We're trying to do a better job with each seed so that we don't have to plant as many, but we, it is a numbers game. So if flea beetle, flea beetle pressure is high, we need more plants, not fewer. I would yes. agree with that. Uh, yeah. Yes, but I, again, there's the trade-offs, um, as mentioned, well, cost being one of them, seeds expensive. Uh, too thick of a canopy uh, may lead to more pathogens down the road. So there, there are a lot, a lot of trade-offs, so you can't take it to the extreme, really. Um, but you can go the other route, too, where you are seeding at such a low rate that uh, as uh, was referred to earlier, you're, you're concentrating the flea beetles on the plants that are there. And plus so, you have flea beetle plants to, con you lose some plants right. with a low seeding rate and there's less there to fill in. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we should just mention, and I did want to make sure that we touch on this at least briefly, that the, the threshold is 25% feeding damage would be sort of the indication that you need to get in there and and control because by the time you get there as we have learned about i think uh jason said something about gucci cologne and axe body spray um just <laughs> calling all the flea beetles into the field numbers just escalate so quickly and cotyledons are so small that that 25 percent feeding damage is about that threshold so um now i want to have this conversation about lambda size so to quickly recap, and, and this isn't about whether this is right or wrong, but this is what we're up against. For Western Canada, Syngenta has pulled uh, Matador off the market because of a labeling change from the PMRA. Adama Canada, at last word, um, was still deciding what it would do with silencers. So it's the same, Lambda size, the same active between those two products, and there is another one as well. Um, that was a that was a foliar application that we no longer have. So what does that leave us with and what do we need to, need to consider as far as John, I think it was mentioned rotating actives. Um, so what foliar spray options are we left with? Okay. So you still do have three major groups. You've okay. got your pyrethroids, which your, uh, lambda psi belongs to. Now, okay. within that group, you have another act of delta methrin, which is your desis or polesi. Yep. That's in the same group. And you've got cypermethrin, which upside or ship would be the uh, okay. brand names for those. And then you have another one, permethrin, which is your ambush, pounce. Um, pounce, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you do have three other groups of pyrethroids so we, we, we when we still do have four really because as you mentioned 
um, silencer, it's still possibly going to be on the market. Um, we, we don't know. We'll wait and see. The tricky part, though, if it is, uh, people just have to be careful of what their end use is with their canola. So there may be less interest in even using that product. We do have the two other classes I mentioned, the, 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 the carbamates, which is your, your, your seven or carbaro. It belongs to a whole different class called the carbamates. Um, it works at least equally well, if not even better than the uh, pyrethroids. Um, a study done in North Dakota where they were comparing uh, a carbamate, a pyrethroid, which I believe was permethrin and um, malathion. Uh, it was a lab study. They were looking at um, mm -hmm. control and residual. Uh, the highest was with the, uh, the carbro. Middle, the, well, the second highest was with the pyrethroid and then malathion. Malathion is that third class that, that is registered foliarly. I don't think it's used uh, highly for flea beetles, though. Uh, I think people, uh, it, it probably doesn't have as much residual as the other two would. Okay. So, but it, it is one thing to, of course, consider. So if we've removed, at least for now, and John, as you alluded to, um, even if we still have a silencer on the market, we may not use it. Um, if you can't guarantee it won't be, um, you know, fed uh, to livestock. So are we concerned, Boyd, about limiting our options a little bit here and worried about n the resistance question? Yeah, I think um, I think part of our concern is probably are we going to have product available if we need it? Um, it's going to put more pressure on the other mm -hmm. uh, active ingredients. Um, something else we have to consider is if we have other insect issues uh, within our mm -hmm. crop later in the season that we might have to apply an insecticide for. Um, mm -hmm. Again, what other uh, insecticides are available? What are the... Um, uh, a maximum number of sprays we can put on our crop in a year, etc. So I think those are that's going to be concerning. Um, for the time being, I think the biggest concern is will there be product available um, if we need it uh, mm -hmm. at your local retail? So. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we don't want to spray unless we absolutely have to. Um, and part of that is always the question of beneficials. So there's a good question about hairy canola, and I'm totally going to ask it if anybody knows anything about where hairy canola is at. Um, but I also want to talk about, do we have natural enemies of the crucifer and striped flea beetles? And can we buy them in a jar is the follow-up one. Um, but <laughs> but what, what kills or predates flea beetles? Well, well, there's actually quite a list of things that have been documented feeding on them, but... I don't know that any of them really feed on them quite well. Uh, lacewing larva, uh, people have observed feeding on flea beetles in the field. Lacewing larva are quick. They can probably catch the odd one. I don't think it would be a big part of their diet. I think they'd much rather look for aphids and caterpillars. Um, there's a type of um, true bug called a damsel bug, which also has been documented uh, preying on flea beetles. But again, I don't think it's a big part of their diet. Uh, there's a type of stink bug, a predaceous stink bug called the spine soldier bug. And it's been found feeding on flea beetles. But once again, I think probably caterpillars are more what it's looking for. And it might uh, opportunistically grab a, a flea beetle or two. But I, again, I don't think it's a big part of their diet. In lab situations, they've been able to, they've observed field crickets feeding on um, the fall field cricket feeding on, oh, sorry, spring field cricket feeding on um, uh, flea beetles. Uh, but again, lab situation, and I doubt it. They're omnivores. I doubt it's a big part of their population. We do have parasitoids as well. We've got a wasp called uh, Microctonus that will parasitize some flea beetles. Problem is they don't do it enough. We don't have the very heavy levels of parasitism that we see in uh, things like army worms, Bertha army worm, even diamondback moths sometimes, populations will just crash because of parasitism. We just mm -hmm. don't see that happening with flea beetles. Okay, so Boyd, um, 
I'm kind of disappointed now because I feel like it wouldn't matter what I put in the jug. Nothing actually really loves them. Unfortunately not, right? These are, mm. and you have to think about it. They're also, um, they're not native species to North America. So nothing had, nothing we have here has co-evolved alongside them to be a specialist on them, unfortunately. And that's when we, you know, when we usually have very good biological control, it's when we have these specialist parasitoids, predators that will feed mm -hmm. on a specific species. And we just don't have that here. Like with our midges. Like we have some wonderful yes. stories to tell about our midges, but not so much these. Okay, so so this does bring up, um, we will talk about Harry Knoll in a minute, but um, Jason's, I wanna talk about seeding dates as well. So two things, seeding dates, pushing them later has been a big discussion uh, in the last um, little while, especially Manitoba, John, in that you had a, horrible seeding season in Manitoba, but it actually, for some of that late planted canola, turned out okay on the flea beetle front, um, as well as the crop. So is that an option? Um, so that's one. And then a follow up to that is always, like with grasshoppers, can we just spray portions of a field? Can we, if we know they're coming from a shelter belt, can we go after them? So let's split that up. Boyd, let's start with the, the strip spraying. Are flea beetles a candidate for spraying portions? Oof. Is this, is this a sometimes answer? Is that what I'm going to get? It, it, it is. Um, you know, oh. there definitely is, uh, with a lot of our species, we have that edge effect, right? We have usually a higher damage along the edge as the insects are moving into our field and encountering it. And then it, a lot of the times is then diluted throughout the field. So it is a possibility to spray around the edges um however i think that's you know that's something we can say is it done very often i don't think so um mm. it, it it is a possibility but then what happens if a few days later you have to spray your whole field too right so i think that's yeah. what's all out what's always on everyone's mind right so. mm -hmm. <sighs> okay John, what about, tell me about the experience last year with late seeded canola. Did we hit upon a possible solution or no? Well, um, I'll say, oh boy, this is where, this is a maybe thing once again. So, <laughs> so what really matters is how quickly that plant gets from the, the day you seed until the three to four mm -hmm. leaf stage. That's critical. Yeah because uh, all your seed, uh, whether or not it has a, a, just a neonic or something else in there, the neonics give you about three weeks of protection, maybe a fourth, depending on weather conditions. Things are a little weather dependent, but you can bank on about three weeks. Now we have had years where people will seed, get really good conditions, good soil moisture, good soil temperatures, and boom, three weeks later, you've got plants with three or four true leaves and no foliar sprays needed. That can happen. It often doesn't because we just don't have the conditions that uh, bring that on. So that's where sometimes late seeding is of benefit because the plants are getting to those more um, resist, more tolerant stages quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you seed too early, the ground is cool, the germination might be delayed. Um, mm -hmm. but a lot does depend on what happens once after you seed, how quickly it germinates and how quickly you get to that three to four leaf stage. Some years, um, seeding early may work. It may be good and it, it inadvertently might even be the better option, uh, you know, depending on what the weather is doing for us. Um, mm -hmm. and I know I realize sometimes growers have to be op opportunistic when they're seeding. Uh, I do know that of growers who have actually switched the rotations of their seeding and put canola a little bit later um, into the ground just to try to avoid some of that flea beetle feeding. And in some years it can work. It's not a guaranteed thing though, because again, um, look at what happened last year. People were, I know of people who were holding on, waiting till about mid-May, um, seeding and hoping that they would have less flea beetle damage. It just, we had cool weather. It was raining too much. Um, 
Yeah. So we tried. We um, tried. We tried. Okay, but it's so someone mentioned it earlier earlier in the chat, and I'm sorry if I missed if I can't remember who it is, but um, they said that basically if we could just foresee what the conditions were going to be, this would be a much easier decision making process. Okay, so there's a few other things I want to cover that have come in on the chat. Great questions. And yes, uh, we'll talk about Harry Canola. Uh, but I just want to send this last uh, shout out to, of course, tonight's show sponsors. Thank you to all our sponsors tonight, Adama Canada, FMC Preschool, and the Canola School. From pre-seeding, cedar setup and checks, to pest identification, advice on nutrient management decisions, and all the way to tips on determining swath timing, Real Agriculture's Canola School is a video series that tackles every facet of the growing season in an engaging and informative format. The Canola School is made possible by support from BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Find out more at canolaschool.com. Okay, we are reaching the end of our hour, which is just flying by. So, but we've got enough time to tackle a couple cool questions that have come in, and there's still a few other things. So, uh, Ray, I wanted to ask this as well. So, this is getting a bit, bit scary. Uh, but if flea beetles are not uh, native to Canada, where did we get them from? Who wants to answer that one? Well, they. <laughs> oh, do you want to go for boy? No, go ahead, John. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you're, uh, we can thank the Europeans mainly. Uh, ah, uh, now, we, we, we really don't know for sure because uh, the striped flea beetle, um, it arrived, it, we believe, in about the 1700s. It's been here for a long time, hundreds of years, actually. Um, so, who, I mean, who knows exactly where. Both of them are uh, Eurasian or more European and where they're found um, or where their native range was. Um, the crucifer arrived a bit later. It was in the night, about the 1920s when the crucifer arrived uh, in BC initially. And we figure very shortly after probably the Atlantic coast, but it didn't take long really within about uh, one to two decades. It was pretty much across the prairies and had become quite an issue. No way to send it back, I guess, eh? So no, we can't collect them all no. back and no. Kind of wish. Okay. Um, now here's a good, this is an excellent, I like how this, how this works. So we've heard about our canola that gives off the smell that the flea beetles love. And also that the male flea beetles are like, come on down, uh, ladies and gents, which is cool. Can we, Boyd, use something like pheromone traps or something like that to get enough of them out of the canola field? That's a great question. Um, it's a possibility in other crops, uh, but in canola, it's difficult. Um, there has been traps with that uh, isothiocyanate that John was talking about um, and using those for monitoring purposes, um, mm -hmm. but uh, not in kind of a mass trap. Um, part of the issue with the, with the pheromones is that they are uh, very difficult to make uh, synthetically mm -hmm. and uh, also quite expensive. So in order to mass produce them, we need uh, basically a cheaper way to do that before we can really start taking advantage of them, unfortunately. Um, now there was mentioned, mm -hmm. someone uh, mentioned about like, what about trap cropping around the edge of the fields? Yeah. Um, that is something that's a possibility. Uh, again, you have that earlier emerging um, crop of the edge attracting your flea beetles in there, then you might be able to control them in there um, and kind of uh, um, and pulling them into that. We call that, and, and you could even, if you had pheromone, you could put pheromone in that trap crop as well and pull them in even more. Um, but it's a, we're still a little ways off from that, unfortunately. Okay. It's a good idea though. Like, I feel like let's keep working with this guys. Okay. Like, Get out a whiteboard and start writing things down. Um, you know, so I say that one, like you guys aren't already doing that. So one thing to keep ahead, in mind, John. though, Lindsay, is uh, so imagine you're a flea beetle and you're trying to find a good spot to eat. Now, in the canola field, you've got our traps giving off this chemical, but you also got a whole lot of plants giving off the same chemical. Yeah. So yeah. 
what may happen is really early in the season when you don't have as many plants you might start getting you know some of the early flea beetles in there and maybe some decent numbers as the crop starts coming up though and you got more and more feeding happening in the field your traps may become less and less and less effective now this uh, right now that um this is somewhat speculatory there there is a research project where we're hoping to test some of this down the road um but that's just something else we have to deal with when we're using any kind of pheromone trap really if you have enough of your target insect in the area they're competing with your pheromone trap right so janet asks a, a great question do healthy plants produce the cyanate as well I like how we've shortened it, Janet. I do that too. Um, so like, does canola naturally give off or only when it's being fed on? It, it has this in its leaves regardless, this isothiocyanate. It's there. It's like one of the glucosinolates. It's, anyway. it's, it's there regardless. It, it's, it's a very um, volatile glucosinolate though. So okay. when, when the leaves are fed on, or when any of the part of the plant's fed on, it gives off this glucosinolate, so it's a volatile one. Now, there's other glucosinolates that aren't as volatile. They're still there. Um, some of those work as feeding stimulants. They're, they don't mm -hmm. volatilize and uh, move away, but they're, they're the things that the flea beetles, when they're tapping around, need to detect to, to actually feed. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so then this brings up, and I know neither of you are canola breeders, although you need a hobby, I'm sure, so if you wouldn't mind. But it brings up, of course, if we can't change the insect, and we're struggling with controlling it with spraying, and spraying has other downsides and all that, can we change the plant? So does anyone know where we're at with hairy canola? Maybe, Boyd, if you could, why would, or why has hairy canola been considered um, part of the management plan for flea beetles? Yeah, so originally hairy canola was developed um, transgenically. Um, so they inserted some genes to help promote it to have more trichomes, those little hairs all over it. Um, and so it showed to be quite effective. Um, unfortunately, there are some issues uh, with the patent uh, that that gene that they put in um, was actually under patent. There was also some issues where the trichomes weren't uh, as distributed throughout the plant as they would like. Um, some of the stems uh, weren't as weren't as hairy. Um, so the the transgenic hairy canola has kind of been shelved. Uh, but there is re there are researchers right now at Agriculture and Agri Food Canada in Saskatoon, who are reinvestigating hairy canola. Um, and they're trying to do a more traditional approach in crossing some uh, naturally hairy brassica. Uh, I think it's brassica velosa with brassica napis and try to naturally, um, well, more naturally uh, cross naturally. these yeah. two plants <laughs> and, and have that hairy trait moved into, into brassica napis. So that work is still being actively pursued. I know we were actually helping some colleagues doing some some testing. So um, it, it's still it's still out there and it's still very much uh, a hope um, for us here on the prairies. So then now we already know that the glucosinolates in these families are different, right? So a mustard plant versus a canola, that sort of stuff. Can we can we breed a canola plant that doesn't give off? so much cyanate that do you see how we're just we're just saying the last part now john what do you think could we do that well uh i guess possibly uh i know people have screened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of canola uh, types to try to find some that are less attractive uh, two flea beetles, and so far, no nothing. Dice, eh? No, uh, there's other other crucifers that the glucosinolates are a little different, and they won't feed on, um, mm. including some of the weedy crucifers. But Brassica napis, we, we're still not close. No, we're not even close. Okay, so Devin puts up a good question about um, if we did something like the midge 
the the varietal blends and we could have a percent hairy and percent non-hairy which i think is great devin we just need to get the actual hairy variety first potentially maybe um but why wouldn't we have it all hairy okay the the other question was on intercropping i think scott had mentioned it earlier so we've talked a bit about trap cropping do, is there do we know if having different species growing together in an intercropping system does that increase or decrease flea beetle feeding do we know that boy do you have any oh yeah go ahead john yeah well, well there has been a couple studies on this and uh, boy you might have been thinking about uh, jeremy hemmel's study um the uh, he he was for his um phd at the university of alberta he he studied um wheat canola intercrops uh, he found no difference in flea beetle damage or levels in the field. And there was a study done, um, oh, I think it was the early 90s now, where they intercropped peas and canola, very similar to our peola nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. And this was done in North Dakota. They, same thing, found no difference. Now, anecdotally, people have been suggesting that they might be seeing somewhat less um, flea beetle activity in some of the piola that is being grown. It would be nice to, um, I guess, uh, redo that study from North Dakota with some of our modern canola and our piola intercrops. I think it would make a nice project. Um, but I'm not aware of any studies that uh, have shown a difference yet for intercrops yeah. with flea beetles. Boy, do you have anything yep, to add? Yeah, I know some active, just some active work um now that piola is more common becoming more common yeah. um there's some active work being done but yeah other than what john says nothing else to add okay so there is some stuff out there i do i do appreciate that we are getting creative in our solution thinking and that we've got lots of great questions here so hats off to everyone for coming up with some of these issues now um this is definitely something obviously that you as entomologists are not going to solve however uh to wrap up tonight's show because we've covered a lot of ground here um and i hope we've hit on at least some of the things we're going to try and suss out um but boyd i know we talked a little bit about what you are working on we've mentioned tonight a couple really key studies that were done a long time ago so if money were no object what study boy that you could wave your wand and say please do this which one would you choose oh well there's two okay um, one would be continuing with hairy canola i think okay. that's that's very promising yep. very interesting um the second would be looking at the the pheromones and the uh plant volatiles that isocyanate it's a tongue twister um it is and and doing something like uh, mass trapping or we call it attract and kill um, where you can actually blend the volatile in some kind of paste or some kind of little kind of wax ball and include maybe an insecticide or some other natural biological agent maybe some fungus that could then potentially kill the flea beetle when it's attracted um i think those would be would be very interesting um kind of reduce potentially you know reduce our usage of, of insecticides um for this crop so i think those would be quite fun yeah okay well if i win the lotto i'll uh, get you some money okay john what about you well i think the work that boyd is doing currently on um whether or not we have resistance is a very ah. important work so fun boyd as well um, I know just some of the grower meetings I've been at this year, um, I've been mentioning about uh, that project, the boys' uh, project, and the growers are, are really keen. I'm, I'm trying to avoid uh, uh, not have uh, several hundred samples come your way. We'll collect <laughs> a few. But, but when I mention it, I've got growers adamant that their flea beetles were resistant to one or another pyrethroid, and I've heard it from for pretty much every pyrethroid where somebody says my thesis wasn't killing my flea beetles uh the next farmer will say pounce didn't work on his 
the next one, it was Matador that wasn't work. So anyway, that, I think that's uh, a certainly important work to do. The other one that might be fun to further investigate, there was some work done in Montana where they looked at a, um, a fungus called Bovaria bassiana, and they found that they were getting mm. some kill with that. As uh, Now, they were doing it as a foliar spray, um, but recently there's been some um, work showing that if you apply this to the seed, the fungus will grow throughout the plant. So you've got this plant with this mm. Bavaria in it and that uh, you can get some flea beetle mortality from that. But again, it's very early research and it's very preliminary, almost anecdotal at this point, but it might be something worth following up on. It, does this have potential to be um, an, another seed treatment that uh, could work? Uh, I know some people in Alberta are seeding some canola with this. Uh, you, you, you can already buy uh, the, the, the fungus. It's, it's a powder you sprinkle into your seed. I know some people are interested in trying it to see if it works based on anecdotal information, but it might be something fun to research down the road. Mm -hmm. I like it. Okay. Well, I'll let you guys know um if i come into a small fortune and see if we can solve this one uh, i i think that those are all incredible incredible projects and i am glad to hear that we are working on the question of resistance because of course we need to know i'm so glad that we are doing that um and that you know we have some options but ultimately this is going to be i think uh again a big one in 2023 so we'll definitely keep tabs um and that that does it for tonight this has flown by Thank you both so much for your time. Um, and uh, I learned more than a few things, including a new word I'm going to have to learn how to say. So thanks for that. Uh, but this has been absolutely fantastic. And thank you to everyone in the comments uh, for asking such great questions. Um, and it makes it a lot of fun to have everybody here. Thanks, of course, to our show sponsors for making this happen. Um, and next week, our 101 episode, we're going to talk about sulfur. Um, so make sure you check that out. All right, Boyd, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, and John, thank you again. No one guessed the insects on your shirt, so I guess I win. Oh, okay. Okay, just Do you remember, you remember what they are, Lindsay? Okay. Okay, the middle one is a weevil of some kind. That's a, oh, that's a, um, oh, crumb, not a cucumber beetle. It's something else like that. The soldier beetle is the yellow one. The yellow one's the soldier beetle. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And then the, oh, asparagus beetle. The red one's an asparagus. asparagus beetle. You got it. Yes. Very good. Okay. And just, just uh, FYI, the yeah. weevil with the really, yeah. really long snout is called the acorn weevil, this one. Super oh. long snouts. We do have them around here. They like acorns, as the name would suggest. And they also kind of look like an acorn. Okay. There you go. So, All right. Yeah. I like it. Thanks so much. All right. Cheers, everyone. We'll see you next week.